this is how con conspiracy theories work so well. It's the confirmation bias. Once you start looking, it's easy to find these things. On Abbey Road, the famous Abbey Road cover, uh, there was a bunch of signs here we all got excited about. The four of them are walking across here, and, and uh, John is dressed as the minister, uh, Ringo as the um, undertaker, Paul is the corpse, he's barefoot, and uh, uh, George is the uh, grave digger in his uh, Levi's there. And, uh, and Paul is left-handed, and he has a cigarette in his right hand, so he's giving us a clue there, uh, uh, or, or his double is. And then you start looking in the background, like that vehicle on the right was his police vehicle there. Huh? And the Volkswagen on the left uh, behind George here, it says 28 if. Paul would have been 28 if he hadn't died. In this act, and it just goes on. Every one of the albums, you can find a couple of dozen little clues. On the back of Abbey Road, you'll see, uh, this is the back part of the back cover, Beatles Abbey Road, but, but, but look at the dots here blowing up. It's a three. There's now three Beatles. And, uh, and this, if you kind of turn sideways, it's a skull. See this, the eye sockets and the nose socket, and that's the skull. And of course, it, see, it's, it's right here. <laughs> My favorite, we used to have these um, inexpensive uh, turntables uh, where you can set the, the speed between 33 and 45, so you engage the electronics, but you disengage the clutch that turns the turntable, and then you put the album on there, and you put the needle on, and you spin it backwards, and you could play the albums backwards. And it turns out on the uh, Beatles double album, on the song uh, Revolution Number no. 9, the voice, it's sort of a weird avant-garde song, but the voice says, I, I downloaded and I could not get it to run on my computer, so, but basically the voice is uh, number nine, number nine, number nine, then you play it backwards and it says, turn me on dead man, turn me on dead man. And see, this was Paul telling us that he's dead from the other side or something like this. <laughs> and, uh, and of course, this, you know, this is back in the in the late 60s, early 70s that this caught on. But now there's this film, White Noise, about how uh, the dead are talking to us through electronic communications, and you can and you can monitor this through phone machines and the static in your uh, television set. It's the same pattern-seeking cognitive bias of just looking for uh, things that are not really there. My favorite example of this is the Bible Code. This is the idol of the marketplace for sure. Uh, I wrote a column about this in Scientific America. I call it codified claptrap. Basically just explaining uh, the silliness of it, how it works, I'm, you're all familiar with this by now, but basically you just take the, uh, a string of uh, Hebrew letters, the original Hebrew Bible, whatever that is, and, uh, and you string them all together in one big long string and then you, take, uh, you skip every nth number. So the skip code is n equals 27 or 263 or 3921, whatever it is, and you put them all in a block of type. The width of the block of type is uh, defined by the end skip search number. So if it's every 27th letter, the, the block of type is 27 letters wide. So it's somewhat arbitrary that way. And then you just begin looking to see if there's any words that, uh, that appear near each other or across each other or are sort of kind of related. And, and this is done with the human eye. You're just subjectively looking. You're just looking. And, of course, Hebrew is read from right to left, but in this game, you're allowed to, to read from right to left, left to right, up to down, down to up, and diagonal in any direction you want, and, the, and they, can be, they can skip as many letters as you like. There could be three between them or whatever. This one, you know, President Kennedy is going to die in Dallas, predicted 6,000 years ago in the Hebrew Bible. Um, so in my column, I pointed out, you know, the obvious flaws of this. I mean, if, if on this particular example, you expanded or contracted, the margins, well, then the pattern would disappear. Oh, anyway, so um, come back one second to that. So we got a letter after the column came out, of course, from the author of that book. We inevitably hear from these people. In this particular case, we heard from his lawyer. Of course, this is America. And uh, <laughs> demanding a, you know, a, that he gets a letter in response of fine. So we let Drosnin reply, and then I replied to his reply. And then I got a really interesting letter from a guy named John Byrne, who I never heard of because I wasn't a big comic book fan. But John Byrne is a comic book writer of Spider-Man and Superman, and he's an illustrator writer. And I guess he's a legend amongst comic book uh, people. And he wrote me this interesting letter that I'll read to you because there's a lesson in it. Reading Michael Drosnin's response to Michael Shermer's column on the Bible Code and its ability to accurately predict the future, I could not help but laugh. I've been a writer and illustrator of comic books for the past 30 years, and in that time I have predicted 
the future. So many times in my work, my colleagues have actually taken to referring to it as the burn curse. It began in the late 1970s. While working on a Spider-Man series titled Marvel Team Up, Team Up, I did a story about a blackout in New York. There was a blackout the month the issue went on sale, six months after I drew it. While working on Uncanny X-Men, I hit Japan with a major earthquake, and again, the real thing happened the month the issue hit the stands. Now these things are fairly easy to predict, but consider these. Well, when working on the relaunch of Superman for DC Comics, I had the Man of Steel fly to the rescue when disaster beset the NASA space shuttle. The Challenger tragedy happened almost immediately thereafter, with time, fortunately, for the issue in question to be redrawn, substituting a space plane for the shuttle. Most recent and chilling came when I was writing and drawing Wonder Woman and did a story in which the title character was killed as a prelude to her becoming a goddess. The cover for that issue was done as a newspaper front page with the headline, Princess Diana Dies. Diana is Wonder Woman's real name. That issue went on sale on a Thursday. The following Saturday, I don't have to tell you, do I? Of course, that's when the real Princess Diana died. My ability as a prognosticator like Drosnin's would seem assured, provided, of course, we reference only the above and skip over the hundreds of other comic books I have produced which featured all manner of catastrophes, large and small, which did not come to pass. That's the confirmation bias. It's selectively remembering the hits and forgetting the misses. So idols are cognitive biases. For example, not only the confirmation bias, but the self-serving bias. Uh, in one college entrance examination board survey of 829,000 high school seniors, 0% rated themselves below average in ability to get along with others. Not one said <laughs> it was below average, while 60% put themselves in the top 10%. This is also called the Lake Wobegon effect, after the <laughs> mythical town where everybody is above average. <laughs> According to a 1997 US News and World Report study on who Americans believe are most likely to go to heaven, 60% chose Princess Diana, 65% thought Michael Jordan, <laughs> this is America, 79% selected Mother Teresa, they hadn't read uh, Christopher's book, and at 87 percent, the person most likely to go to heaven was the survey taker. <laughs> I really like that. This research is quite interesting. People that study morality think they're more moral than other people. Business people think they're more moral, and it just goes on and on. Everybody has this. Um, Princeton University psychologist Emily Pronin has done a lot of interesting research on this subject, tested a generalized idol called bias blind spot, in which subjects recognize the existence and influence in others of eight different specific cognitive biases, like the confirmation bias, the self-serving bias, and so on. But they fail to see those same biases in themselves. Of course, it's hard to see it in yourself. In one study on Stanford University students, when asked to compare themselves to their peers on such personal qualities as friendliness, they predictably rated themselves higher. But even when the subjects were warned about the better than average bias and asked to reevaluate their original assessment, 63% claimed that their initial evaluations were objective, and 13% even claimed to have originally been too modest. <laughs> In other words, you tell them, now look, there's this, you know, this Lake Wobegon effect. Every, everybody thinks they're better than average. Now take the test again. Well, in reassessing it, I think I actually am really better than. <laughs> I was being too modest. <laughs> Cronin randomly assigned subjects high or low scores on a social intelligence test. Unsurprisingly, those given the high marks rated the test fairer and more useful than those receiving low marks. But when asked if it was possible that they had been influenced by the score on the test, subjects responded that the other participants were negatively influenced, but not them. For thee, but not for me. She has another one called the introspection illusion along these lines in a third study in which Pronin queried subjects about what method they used to assess their own and others' biases. She found that people tend to use general theory.